Hello, welcome to the Liberty Church of Christ. We are going through the Bible, and tonight we are on lesson number 68, and we are finishing the Old Testament with Malachi, the last of the 12 prophets. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you so much that you have blessed this journey that we're taking from Genesis to Malachi, and even between the Testaments. We pray that this journey has been helpful and encouraged people to read the Bible, read your word, for your word is worthy. Father, please bless us as we go into your New Testament in the coming weeks. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes, we're on our last book of the Old Testament, and that's Malachi. If you have your king's chart, you can look at the very bottom of the king's chart, and you'll see Malachi, how that he wrote about 430 years before Christ to about 400 years before Christ. Now remember, 200 years before Malachi is when the Babylonians came in, about 600 and 606 BC, and took away the Jews into captivity. After 70 years under the Persian Empire, the Medes and the Persians, they allowed the Jews to go back. So under the Persian Empire, the Jews were treated quite well. Cyrus, the Persian king, allowed them to go home, paid for federally the rebuilding of their temple and the rebuilding of the city. And under the leadership of Nehemiah and Ezra, which kings allowed them to go back to rebuild the temple and the walls, about 444 years before Christ is when they got that all completed and done. And now, 430 years before Christ, just a few years after we have a new wall, we have a new temple, we have new uh, buildings built in Jerusalem, Malachi begins his ministry. And you would think that he would have nothing but good to say. Why? Because the people should have been rejoicing. We're back in our homeland after being away into captivity for 70 years under the Babylonian captivity. And the Persians are treating us quite nicely. In fact, one of our people, Esther, was the queen of Persia. So they were certainly uh, treated well during that time. You think that they would be happy, but they weren't. The priests started doing corruptible things and robbing God with tithes and offerings. And Malachi had to stop and warn them. Well, let's get into Malachi. There's just four chapters. But what we're going to see after we look at these four chapters, we're going to move on to the period between the Old Testament and New Testament. But let's get into Malachi. Chapter number one, look at verses seven and eight. We find that these priests had been offering defiled food on the altars. The, the animals that they offered were blind and lame and sick. And God was upset with them. You're not giving me your best. But yet these priests were asking the question, what do you mean we're not giving you our best? We're, we're worshiping, aren't we? Be satisfied with it. But that's not the way God feels. He wants your best. In verses 13 and 14 of Malachi chapter 1, God said, I'm God. I'm the king of kings. I am in control. I'm the great authority. I'm worthy to, of your best. So give your best. I'm upset with you, priest, that you're not. In chapter number 2, verse number 1, we read this. And now, O you priests, this commandment is for you. He's talking to the leadership, the leadership of spiritual things. And he's telling them that they're not doing right. They need to do right. They're God's messengers. And they're not giving the word of God out properly. They're not telling about his covenant properly. And they're all the time saying, well, what are we doing wrong? You see, they are getting lackadaisical in their worship. And they think they're doing okay. Look at chapter 3. Verse number one says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, 
whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, these priests were supposed to be God's messenger, but he's telling them, I'm going to send my messenger before the great day of the Lord. Now, we know that that messenger that is going to come before the Lord is John the Baptist. We learn that in Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. You can read that for yourself. Matthew said and recorded that John the Baptist came and he was preparing the way before the Lord. The priests of Malachi's day, uh, they were robbing God with tithes and offerings, and, and God just told them, if you would just do what I tell you to do and give your best, well, I will open the windows of heaven, and I'll pour out blessings on you that you can't even receive. You can't even use it all. But these priests were corrupt, and God told them, I'm going to send someone later that's going to bring in a, and usher in a better covenant. Well, look at chapter 4, verse number 2. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness, that Son is S-U-N, the light of the world, as it were, the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. There's somebody coming, and you shall go forth and grow up as, as calves of the stall. Uh, everything's going to be okay when, uh, when he comes. He's the son of righteousness, the day spring. There's going to be healing in his wing. We believe that to be Jesus Christ. And John the Baptist is the messenger that's coming before. In fact, look at chapter 4 of Malachi, verse number 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, Elijah, if you'll remember, didn't die. He was walking along with his disciple Elisha, and a chariot came down, and a whirlwind, and, and the whirlwind picked up Elijah and took him off into heaven. Now, many believe, perhaps, that this Elijah would come down from heaven just like that. He's not dead. He'll come back and he'll prepare the way and of the Lord, the, the great and notable day, the dreadful day of the Lord. And they were looking for the physical Elijah to return. But Jesus explained exactly who Elijah would be that was going to prepare the way for him. And that would be John the Baptist. Listen to Matthew chapter 11, verse number 14. If you will receive it, this is Elijah, talking about John the Baptist in that context, which was for to come. Malachi said, Elijah will come. Prepare the way for the Lord. Jesus is saying, if you'll believe it, if you'll receive it, John the Baptist is Elijah. And he is preparing a way for me, Jesus. And that dreadful day of the Lord, a lot of people look at that, oh, that's got to be judgment day. No, Elijah, John the Baptist, prepared the way for Jesus' coming. It was described as the great and dreadful day of the Lord when Jesus came on the scene in his first coming. Now, certainly it's going to be a, the day of the Lord in his second coming. But this is a reference to his first coming. That's all of Malachi, chapters 1 through 4, but we are left off right there. And from that day until John the Baptist gets here, there's 400 years of silence. Now, it's called 400 years of silence because we don't have a biblical prophet from Malachi all the way to John the Baptist in the New Testament, in Matthew. So that's why it's referred to as the years of silence or the silent years. But it was a lot going on during those 400 years. If you like history, go back and study the history. Let me recommend to you a Jewish historian that covers all of that history. His name is Josephus. Go look up his works. You can buy his books. You can look them up online. You can read all about the works of Josephus. He is just a Jewish 
historian that tells about Jewish history. And this is included in those 400 years between Malachi and Matthew. But let's hit the highlights of what happened during that 400 years to bring us up to the Gospels in Matthew. The first thing that we see that Malachi is during the days of the Babylonian Empire, uh, he, that has been defeated, and now the Persians have taken over. So that's the time that Malachi is living when things are going quite well. Uh, like I said, Esther was a Jewish queen of the Persians. So, so the Jews were treated pretty nicely during that time. But there was another emperor that's coming on the scene. The Grecian Empire, led by Alexander the Great, 333 years before Christ, conquered the Persians. Now remember, Malachi wrote about 400 to 430 years before Christ. A hundred years later comes the Grecians, led by Alexander the Great, and conquers the Persians. Now, as he's making his way through the conquering of all of that area, he comes through the Palestinian area where present-day Israel is, where Jerusalem is located in that day, and he treats them kindly. He sets them up and was nice to them. Now, he conquers them, and he expects them to pay taxes, and he expects them to obey the Grecian laws, but he's not hard on them. In fact, when he goes into Egypt, the Egyptians look at Alexander the Great as a deliverer from the harsh Persian oppression because they were not treated as well under the Persian Empire. So they were glad that they had a conqueror to come in and take the Persians out of the picture, and they were happy to receive Alexander the Great. In fact, Alexander the Great built a city in Egypt, the northern part, right at the Mediterranean Sea, called Alexandria, named after Alexander the Great, right? And Alexandria it becomes an educational center. There's great library in Alexandria. In fact, in the New Testament, we meet somebody. His name is Apollos. He is a friend, a companion of Paul. And Aquila and Priscilla converts Apollos to Christianity. Well, Apollos is from that area of Alexandria, and that's why he's so polished. That's why he can speak so well. It's because he's got that education from that great city of Alexandria. That is exactly what Alexander the Great's intention is. You see, Alexander the Great studied under Aristotle. He was a student of Aristotle. And the philosophy that he adopted from Aristotle the Grecian philosophy, the Greek way of life, he really believed that if I could get the Greek culture in all of these cities in my empire, that I could unite the world. He believes that strongly in the Grecian culture. The Grecian culture is known as Hellenism. So what he's trying to do when he goes in and conquers a city, he'll build a nice building, some public works, some public buildings, some libraries, some gymnasiums uh, where they could do the Greek games, the Olympians and all that. He built theaters, he built giant theaters and coliseums. And, and he appealed to all these cultures, adopt our way, become more like, that's why there's Greece, Greek architects everywhere in, in that area, because he's wanting to get that culture all throughout the empire. And some of the Jews adopted it. They said, yes, we'll, we'll happily become Grecian in our culture. They were known as the Hellenists. You've got your Pharisees, Sadducees, and then you've got Hellenists. And these Hellenists are going to be looked at by some of these other sects of the Jewish culture as, as abandoning them. You sold out our Hebrew heritage because you are adopting this new Grecian culture, this Hellenism. These people did that. Well, the Greek language is becoming the common language through all of it, and that's a blessing from God. 
Because when you have a common language, then you can communicate from culture to culture, from nation to nation, and you can bring and unify people together with common language. And that's what Alexander the Great had in mind. I want there to be a united language to unite the world. And that's a blessing because by the time that Jesus, remember this is about 300 years before Christ. So about 300 years later, the, the Greek language is, is all into that world empire and people can communicate. So when Peter, James, and John, and Paul start going on their missionary journeys, they can speak Greek and everybody can. Sure, they could also speak Hebrew and they could speak their, their Jewish language, but, but they couldn't communicate that when they got to Athens, so they spoke Greek, and they wrote the New Testament in Greek so it could be distributed. Uh, so God blessed uh, the world when he brought Alexander the Great and the Grecian Empire to the world at that time to set up this ability for the gospel to be spread so quickly. Now, many people even uh, adopted Greek names. Uh, I want to point that out. Remember, Saul is a Hebrew name, but yet he adopted the Greek name of Paul in the New Testament. And also, the anointed one that was predicted by all these prophets to come someday, uh, that was called the Messiah, Mashiach in Hebrew. And now... It's known widely as the Christ. So when Jesus come on the scene, it wasn't uncommon to have him called the Christ because the Greek culture was so permeated in that area at that time. Well, Alexander the Great died when he was 33 years old. And when he died, the Grecian Empire broke up into four different sectors each one ruled by a different general. And this was prophesied to happen by Daniel. Let's go back to Daniel chapter number 8. If you'd like to read with me or listen as I read, Daniel 8 verses 8 and 9 is a prophecy of what happens right here when Alexander the Great dies and his Grecian empire is broken into four sectors. It says, therefore, the he-goat, that's Alexander the Great in this uh, prophecy, in this vision, he's a he-goat. Well, therefore, the he-goat waxed very great, and he was. And when he was strong, the great horn, that's him, the king uh, of the Grecian Empire, was broken. And for it, or in its place, came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. There's going to be four generals that's going to take four sections of the Grecian Empire. And one of them is going to be a pretty strong uh, king, and, and, and he was. And we'll see that as we go through this uh, enter between the Testaments. Now, the Grecian Empire, when it broke up, where did Jerusalem fall in? What sector did it fall? Well, it fall under the general Ptolemy. That's P-T-O-L-E-M-Y. Ptolemy or Ptolemy the first. And Ptolemy comes in there I think the P is silent. But he comes in there as the general and he takes over the Jerusalem area and the Palestinian area where Israel is today. And he becomes the authority over that. He treats the Jews pretty kindly. Now he, again, he goes in and he conquers them, but he expects them to be humble to him and, and they could have their Jewish traditions and and so he's kind of nice to them, uh, but he really is going to enforce the Grecian culture on them, but not hard. You can still have your Jewish traditions as long as you don't give him any trouble and you pay your taxes and everything will be fine. Well, when Ptolemy II take over, we're still in the rule of the Ptolemies, 
is called a dynasty, the Ptolemies. And when Ptolemy II comes in, a lot of the Jews, they, they appreciated that they were being treated nicely. And many of them went down to Alexandria in that educational center. And they began to be educated with the, with the Greece culture. And, and they, they, Hellenism was a good idea to them. And Ptolemy II said, well, I tell you what, Jews, I, I'm nice to y'all. I, I do want you to appreciate the Greek culture, but I appreciate your culture too. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to set aside 70 Jewish scholars, and I want you to translate the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi, where we're studying tonight. And I want you to translate the entire Old Testament into Greek. Now, I realize it's not in Greek. It's written in Hebrew. But y'all are Jewish scholars, and there you are in Alexandria. You have an educational center of the world. Uh, translate it. And they did. The 70 Jewish scholars translated the Old Testament into Greek. And it's called the Septuagint. That's what that translation's called. The abbreviation for that is L. XX. That's a Roman numerals. L is 50. X is 10. So LXX is 50 plus 10 plus 10. So LXX is 70, representing the 70 scholars that, that wrote the thing or that translated the thing. Well, that Old Testament written in Greek just flew throughout the empire because everybody could read Greek. It was a common language. And when Jesus quoted from it. He often quote the Septuagint. He quoted from the Arabic too, Arabic and Hebrew, but the Septuagint was available. Uh, Paul used the Septuagint. Uh, no doubt, Peter and all the others, they had access to this translation that was common to everybody. So when you'd go out and preach the gospel and you want to refer to the Old Testament, you'd, you'd say, well, it's just like the prophet said, and then he would quote from the Septuagint. Many of them would. So it's a blessing that uh, God gave us that Grecian empire at that time. However, that's the Ptolemies. There's other generals out there, right? That was just the one. There's three more. There was another one out there that was over the Syrian area up north. And that fella was named Seleucus. Seleucus I. Ptolemy I was over the Jews. Seleucus I was that general, one of those four generals that broke off the Grecian Empire, and he took over the northern area. Well, he didn't get along well with the Ptolemies. In fact, he wanted some of their land. So there was a struggle between them. And ultimately, Seleucus I of Syria come down and took away the Jewish land, the, the Palestinian area, away from the Ptolemies. And now the Jews are no longer under the Ptolemy general. They're under the Seleucid general. And that's what they're going to be known as. Their authority is the Seleucids. So how did the Seleucids treat them when they took over? Well, the Seleucids were awful. They had no idea about them wanting to keep their Jewish traditions. Now, the Ptolemies tolerated and even translated the Bible in Greece, Greek, but not the Seleucids. The Seleucids said, no, we want you to be Hellenist. We want you to become Greek. And they really forced those Jews to do that. The title that they received was Antiochus, all the rulers. So Antiochus III, he's also known as Antiochus the Great, came in in 199 BC, 199 years later. This is about... Uh, a hundred years after the Grecian Empire was established in 333 B.C., now we got 199 B.C., so we're, we're traveling through time here. But now the Seleucids are taking over about 200 years before Christ was born, and they're stomping on the Jews. And they're saying, we're going to eradicate the Jewish traditions. Uh, we don't love them at all. We're going to force them to become Hellenist. And the Hellenistic Jews, they liked it. They, they kind of become partners with the Seleucids and said, sure, you know, use us. We're Jewish, but 
but we love the Hellenistic ideology. And so we'll help you uh, establish your power and authority over these uh, Orthodox Jews. Uh, we want to stomp out the, the old traditional Jewish ideas. Well, when Antiochus IV comes in, his name is Antiochus Epiphanes. He was ruthless. He didn't hold back. He came in and he was ready to murder. He's ready to kill. He put the death penalty in place if you circumcise your child. You remember that's the a Jewish uh, law given by Abraham, circumcise your child the eighth day of its life. And these Jews circumcised their children and, and Antiochus Epiphany said, if you do, I'll kill you. He also took away and made it illegal for them to honor the Sabbath day. And that was a holy day to the Jews. You can't honor the Sabbath day. You can't honor any holy day. Whatever holy days the Jews had, he outlawed them. And he was so cruel to these Jews that did not want to Hellenize. They wanted to hold on to their Jewish culture. Well, he was so awful that he came in to their Jerusalem temple, their holy place, and he sacrificed a pig on the altar. Now, you know how pork is, is against Jewish. That's an unclean thing. And to sacrifice a pig on the holy temple altar defiles it. And that was his way of saying, I care nothing about your traditions. I want to break all your traditions. And then he set up an altar to Jupiter, a Greek god, Jupiter, and just defaced the temple in doing so. Well, they started enforcing all these laws from Jerusalem and outside to the areas. Well, about 15 miles uh, outside of Jerusalem, there was an old priest. His name, if I can pronounce it correctly, is Mattathias. We're going to call it Mattathias. He's a very old priest. And everybody thought these Hellenistic Jews and these Syrians, these Seleucids, uh, they came in and they just thought Mattathias is just an old nothing and he'll bow down to us and we'll just go right on into their, his little village, his little town, and we'll start sacrificing uh, pagan gods on their uh, altars and he'll, he'll, he'll not give us any trouble. Well, Mattathias did give them trouble. He said, no way, I'm not going to yield to that. We're Jews, we believe in Jehovah God, and he rebelled against them and defeated that, that incoming army. And, and he had five boys, and they all got behind him, and then they got followers behind them, and they started waging guerrilla warfare against these Syrians. When they send a little pocket of an army in, they just jump out of nowhere and, and just kill these Syrians, these Seleucids. The Seleucids were having a hard time keeping these Jews in, in check. Well, Mattathias, of course, was an old man, and shortly he died. Well, when he died of these five boys, his third son, whose name was Judas, which is Hebrew Judah, he took over the, the military leadership, and everybody called him the Maccabee. Judas, you're the Maccabee. Well, that word, Maccabee, translates into the hammer. You're a hammer, and you're hammering away at these Seleucids that's trying to come in here and force us to give up our culture and take on the Hellenistic way. And so the Maccabee dynasty was born, and they began to try to fight against the Syrians over and over and over again. And finally, they decided what they would do is go into Jerusalem and conquer it, get it back. And they did. On December the 25th, uh, in about 168 years before Christ was born, they took the city back over. They destroyed the altar that he had set up to Jupiter, and they rededicated that temple at that battle to God. And they set up a feast. And in that feast, they... Uh, called it Hanukkah. And Hanukkah means the Festival of Lights. It's also called the Fe Feast of Dedication because they rededicated the temple to God after it had been defiled. Well, Jesus, 
I mean, that was 168 years before Christ. Jesus celebrated the Feast of the Dedication. <coughs> Excuse me. If you read John chapter 10, verse number 22, you'll see that Jesus celebrated that holiday because it was a Jewish holiday. It was like our 4th of July, our Independence Day. Now, after Judas is, is dead, uh, another son takes over, but finally, and his name's Simon, but finally Simon's son takes over, and his name is John Hyrcanus. That's spelled H-Y-R-C-A-N-U-S. And he changes the dynasty. It's no longer the Maccabean dynasty. He, his dynasty becomes known as the Hasmonean. So the Hasmonean dynasty takes over. They're still Jewish, but they're different, they're different dynasty, different uh, belief system. And as, as uh, the Hasmoneans take over, they start spreading. This John guy, he starts spreading the Jewish out. He, he, he takes over land. He, he, he expands the Jewish borders. And the Syrians are just having a really hard time with it. But during that time, there's inner conflict because you've got the people who want to be Hellenistic and they became known, uh, some of those have been adopted as the Sadducees. And then you got these rigid Orthodox Jews that wanted to go back with the Maccabean tradition, and they became known as the Pharisees. And so you got the Pharisees against the Sadducees. You got the political uh, problems going on too. This family wants to take over that family and create new dynasties. So they were on the verge of civil war. Uh, Jerusalem just couldn't, couldn't maintain itself, even though it was trying, at the same time, trying to get rid of the Syrians, the Seleucids that were attacking them everywhere. Well, all the while this is going on, uh, fighting against the, the attacks of the Seleucids, the inner conflict of civil war between religion and politicians, uh, all the while there was another government being established, and that government was the government of Rome, the Roman Empire was growing. Under Julius Caesar and then Augustus Caesar, all these Caesars were coming out and they were just taking over land and they were taking over the Grecian Empire a bite at a time. And they hadn't been bothering the Jews yet. They're fighting amongst themselves and they, they hadn't have time to bother the Jews. But the Jews were next on their list and they the Romans did come in. And when the Romans come in, they took over everything. They said, you're ours. We're, we're powerful. You belong to us. And we're going to create order in this here town. And they even, but they, but they respected Jewish traditions. And they even said, well, we'll give you a king of the Jews. We'll let you have a little puppet king under the Roman Empire. And they set up a guy named Herod. Herod was crowned eventually after some conflict and political turmoil he was crowned as king of the Jews. Now, the Jews hated Herod. They didn't love him one little bit. But Herod tried to curry their favor, so he was building buildings. He even rebuilt the temple, made it even much better during his reign. But Herod was a power-hungry nut, is what he was. He killed his own kids if they crossed him. And one day, some wise men came in from the east, and he inquired of them, what, what's your business here? He said, well, we are looking for the king of the Jews. Well, I'm the king of the Jews, Herod thought. What do you mean you're looking for him? Oh, you don't know. The prophecy said that the king of the Jews would be born right here in this area. And we've seen his star. And we're here to honor him and worship him. And Herod said, oh, really? Well, go find him and come back and tell me all about him so I can go and worship him too. He had no intention of worshiping him. He had every intention of killing him. And so when the wise man actually went out and found the king of the Jews that Malachi had prophesied would come, and that other Old Testament prophets had prophesied would come, they were warned in the dream, don't you go back and tell Herod. You go back to your homeland a different way. Well, when Herod found out that they weren't coming back, he asked his own scribes, hey, where is this guy going to be born? They said, well, in Bethlehem of Judea. And that's exactly where Jesus Christ was born. 
And that brings us right up to Matthew. And Lord willing, we'll look at that next week. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, thank you so much again for allowing us to study your Bible and to know that you are the God of your people. Your people in the Old Testament was the Jews. We honor that. We respect that. We know that. And we, we have learned so much about how you care about your people and how you'll punish your people because you hold them accountable. But it brings us to the New Testament, the one that you had envisioned all the while. And we pray, Father, that you'll bless our study of such a wonderful covenant that we, Christians, are under. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord willing, we'll see you guys in class next week.